it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mattis, who will cover the basic training for WM. Thanks, Carl. It's always a pleasure to speak at the uh, ed educational forum. Uh, yesterday, before I rushed to the airport to get on my flight, I met with a patient who found us through the IWMF. And the, and the patient had been diagnosed about two years ago and was desperate for information. And he came to me and he actually had, some, he had neuropathy as part of his disease. And I said, well, uh, you know, have you seen a neurologist? Have you, you know, he go, and have you had a test called MAG and GM1? He goes, yeah, I found those on the IWMF website and I made my doctor run the test. So the IWMF is an amazing patient organization and it's a pleasure to be able to help all of you here. So we're going to get right into it right here. So the, what are we going to do today? Well, this is a, uh, we're going to talk about what's, what's, what, what causes WM, what are the roots beneath WM. We're going to talk about basic stuff that doctors always talk about. Incidents, risk factors, how do people with WM present to their physician. We're going to talk about how we diagnose WM. A little bit broadly how we treat it. There'll be much more detail later in the educational forum about treatment. And then we're going to get into genetics. I didn't include much about genetics last year, but you're going to hear about the genetics over and over and over again. So I'm going to do a very basic level intro to genetics. And then we have people who do this every breathing minute of their life, specifically one seated in the back middle of the room here uh, that know a lot more about it than I do. And then this is going to be a refresher course for the, for the, for the veterans. And then for the new attendees, it's hopefully will provide the groundwork for getting the most out of this form uh, possible. So what is WM? So WM is a blood cancer. It's a type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So people say, what is, what's a blood cancer? A blood cancer, in my mind, is a cancer that begins out of tissue in the bone marrow or in the lymph or spleen tissue. And, so, and, blood, and blood cancers occur, and lymphomas specifically occur, when these cells called lymphocytes, and in WM, not just lymphocytes, but plasma cells, they decide that we are no longer going to follow the rules. Normally, Blood cells are, uh, the production of blood cells is controlled in a very orderly fashion. Uh, blood cells are produced. Uh, the body has a, a way of knowing the exact inventory necessary for these cells. We maintain this exact inventory. When the blood cells have done their duty, they die, they're turned over, new cells are produced. And in blood cancers, specifically, specifically WM, what happens is that these cells decide that no, that doesn't sound good to us, we want to take over, so we're going to reproduce out of control. We're going to make more of us than we're intended to be there. And furthermore, not only are we going to make more of us, but we're not going to die like we're supposed to. So production goes up, and then the, the cells that are supposed to die don't die as much, so the net result of that is that over time, we accumulate these lymphoma cells in, in WM that occurs inside the bone marrow. The other hallmark about WM is that these cells that accumulate these lymphoma cells, they make a protein called IgM. And IgM we're gonna talk about a fair amount today, and, the, and it's always IgM for Waldenstrom's. The disease is named after Jan Waldenstrom, who was a Swedish oncologist, and he first described this uh, the same year as D-Day, which was celebrated yesterday, 1944. So you guys are in rarefied air if you have WM. WM is a very rare lymphoma. It's a three in a million lymphoma. There are only 1,500 new cases diagnosed per year. The other disease that I treat a lot during my day is called multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is 1% of all cancers. It's a pretty rare cancer. There are about 20 to 25,000 cases diagnosed annually in the US for, for myeloma and look at where WM is. WM is more common in people in their 60s and 70s. Uh, like most cancers, males are more commonly afflicted than females, Caucasians and other ethnic groups. And what's remarkable is that in 20% of cases, you can find a pretty strong family uh, predisposition. The gentleman I spoke about who I saw yesterday afternoon, his dad had chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It's a very common association. It's another chronic blood cancer to have, and then the son has WM. So let's talk about how we define Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. T two things are required. One, you have to have this thing called IgM in your blood over here. And then you have to have these lymphoma cells in the bone marrow. And not just any lymphoma cell in the bone marrow. You have to have a lymphoma cell that's called lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. Lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. Now, obviously, 
if you have to say that all day in your job, that gets really hard. So the doctors tend to call it LPL. And that's what we say. I have LPL in my marrow. How much LPL was in your marrow? That's the terminology that we use. When we diagnose WM based on those two criteria, the doctor then has to decide, is my patient symptomatic or without symptoms, asymptomatic? And if you're asymptomatic, we call that smoldering. If you're symptomatic, it just becomes symptomatic. And the distinction is critical. And the reason the distinction is critical is because asymptomatic patients should not be treated. Not don't need to be treated, should not be treated if you're asymptomatic. Whereas symptomatic patients, because they're having an issue, should be treated. We'll talk a lot about this. And the one thing that also is out there, and people are always at the forum who have something called IgM neuropathy. And IgM neuropathy may not quite meet the definition for Waldenstrom's, because you may just have a small amount of IgM in the blood, a small number of LPL cells in your marrow, but that little IgM protein that's in your blood it can be perpetrating a pretty difficult peripheral neuropathy. So there are people that have IgM neuropathy who don't technically meet the diagnosis of Waldenstrom's, but they're welcome in our clinic, of course. So in WM, when you look at a bone marrow, and this is, this is a sample of bone marrow, so if you have WM and it's been diagnosed properly, somebody put a very sharp needle into your pelvic bone and withdrew bone marrow, because you have to do that to make the diagnosis properly. And when you do that, you see a few different cells. And you have these one cells over here called plasma cells, which are recognizable to blood people, because the nucleus, which is this purple part here, is shoved way over to the side of the cell. That's how you identify a plasma cell when you're looking uh, at, at the cells under a microscope. And the lymphoma cells have a, this, the, this nucleus occupies most of the cell and is kind of smack in the middle, like a fried egg or something. And so the, uh, the critical thing is that these cells are all related. They're not different. They're all related to each other. And they're both present in the bone marrow of people with Waldenstrom's. So a very common question that people have when they're diagnosed with any cancer, including WM, and if patients don't ask me this, I bring it up with them, they, they want to know, why did I get this disease? What causes WM or what causes leukemia? What causes colon cancer? Patients just want to know. And in the situation with WM, virtually all cases occur through what I call bad luck, meaning that they just occur by chance. Now, there are things that increase your chance of getting WM. Um, and, the, and the last bullet point here is that there's something called MGUS that does that. Uh, but bad luck is usually what I tell people. We know Vietnam veterans uh, have more cases of, of lymphoma and specifically WM. And again, the familiar part is kind of interesting. So it, when you take a very careful family history in patients with Waldenstrom's, you can find in a first three relative, uh, you know, that's a son, daughter, uh, parent, um, cousin, that kind of thing. You can find another either Waldenstrom's or closely related B cell cancer. And some of this work has been published by uh, uh, Steve Treon and his group in Boston. I'm going to cite Dr. Treon's work frequently this morning uh, and his team. And if you look here, this looked at a, this is an older study, but it makes the point that this is uh, 257 patients with WM where careful family histories were obtained. And in the light blue, which is the majority of the pie here, uh, these are, pa these are uh, patients who had Waldenstrom's in a first degree family, you know, in a first degree family member. But not just Waldenstrom's, you can see other, other uh, blood cancers as well. You can see non-Hodgkin lymphoma, myeloma, in the example of the patient I presented this morning, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, MGUS, fortunately not very much acute leukemia because that's horrible, uh, but uh, uh, you can find this. And there are people on the planet that are very interested in learning about familial Waldenstrom's. And in particular, Dr. McMaster, who frequently speaks at WM conferences and has written in The Torch, which is a publication of the IWMF, has talked a lot about uh, familial predisposition for WM. And so if, you if you're interested in that, she's e very approachable and easy to contact. It would be eager to, to meet you, I'm sure. A really common question that we get when we see patients and we explain the familial predisposition is, well, do I need to have my family members tested? And the answer to that is in the italics at the very bottom of this slide. So Dr. Robert Kyle, um, who hopefully will be here, uh, he's not going to be here this year. He's the godfather of Waldenstrom's in our country, for sure. Um, and Dr. Kyle makes an excellent point, and it goes as follows. So if, if Waldenstrom's is a three in a million cancer, 
And let's just say that you have a predisposition that, that triples or quintuples your risk of getting that cancer. Instead of a three in a million risk, you have a nine in a million risk or a 15 in a million risk. Do we go hunting for disease or drawing blood on people? No, we don't do that. So what Dr. Kyle says is there is no additional risk because patients do wonder about this for their, you know, usually sons and daughters and often siblings. So I always say there's no additional risk. So let's talk a little bit more about this thing called LP, L, LPL, or lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma. And so how do these cells misbehave? Well, we know how they accumulate, right? They overproduce and they don't die like they're supposed to. We know that. But what else do they do? Well, one of the things that they do is they make this protein called IgM. And, and this is a type of what's called an antibody that normally in our bodies, antibodies are there to uh, fight, um, fight pr uh, infectious predators. They're there to, to fight off uh, bacteria and so forth and different things. But in WM, this IgM, again, it doesn't follow the rules, and the IgM can actually perpetrate and cause symptoms. We're gonna talk about some of those in a little bit. Also, the LPL cells, those lymphoma cells that grow in the marrow, they can, um, they can make people have fevers and sweats and just feel poorly, and very rarely they can actually mutate or transform and become a more aggressive type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma called large B-cell lymphoma. We term that transformation. We'll talk about this more later. Again, the patient I saw yesterday who had done his reading on the IWMF website said to me, he goes, how do I know what, which of my symptoms are related to the IgM, which are related to the lymphoma cells in my bone marrow? I'm going, this, is, this guy was like advanced. <laughs> so what happens when those LPL cells get inside the bone marrow and begin to grow, uh, what, what happens? Well, the, the, one of the analogies I often use with patients is, is the garden, the garden analogy. I'm still working on this one. And so what happens is these LPL cells, they're clones of each other, and they try to take over the bone marrow. And by doing so, we have the weeds on the left-hand side of this slide here. So you have a garden here that's overrun with weeds, and the weeds are the LPL cells. And the healthy cells are the flowers, the normal flowers. And in WM, very often, you can have complete overrunning of the marrow with the weeds to have it be full of lymphoma, or you can just have a partial overrunning of the marrow with the weeds. But no matter what, when those weeds get there, and there are enough of those weeds, in there, and depending on their, their, their behavior, they can inhibit the production of your normal flowers, of your normal blood cells. And so uh, the, 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 the actual lymphoma cells growing in your marrow can inhibit the production of your normal blood cells and produce symptoms that make people feel sick. So when, when they are symptomatic, what we basically do is we try to get rid of the weeds. And if we do a really good job, our garden looks like this if we get rid of the weeds. But sometimes in WM, you don't have to get rid of all the weeds to make somebody feel better. If you just cut them down a whole bunch, or at least a reasonable amount, you can make patients feel dramatically better. And how this translates into WM treatment from a doctor's perspective is sometimes when we treat people, our goal is just to cut the weeds back a little bit and let our patient feel better. And that's called symptom control. And other times, we treat people uh, with the intent of getting rid of all the weeds, and that's called deepest response possible. And WM doctors have to work through this with their patient when they're deciding on a treatment plan. Let's talk about uh, IgM, because IgM is a really different, uh, a really different uh, antibody than the other types of antibodies. So let me give you an example. So in the normal situation, we have these cells in our body, they're called normal B lymphocytes, and they make these antibodies. And antibodies are IgG, IgA, IgE, IgD, and IgM. And you look at this, and if you remember from Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other, and the IgM looks very different than the rest of them, doesn't it? And so what happens is these IgMs, they're not content just to have one little antibody thing here. They have five of them that get together. It's called a pentamer. And so these, these five proteins all stick together. And so why is that important? Well, that's important because if you get enough IgM in your blood, this is a big old, this is a big protein. If you get a lot of this protein in your blood, it can thicken your blood. And we call that in the WM world hyperviscosity. And again, the analogy we use with patients is trying to run 40 weight motor oil through your veins instead of a, a more of a liquid through your veins like blood and normal serum. So that's why, that's one of the ways that IgM causes trouble because it's such a big, big protein. Normally, in, the, in, in, in our in healthy situation, non-WM, non-blood cancer, 
we have a mix of all these kinds of antibodies in our body, and that's called polyclonal. Poly meaning many, many clones. So we have a bunch of different kinds of IgG, different kinds of IgM, different kinds of IgD or IgA and so forth. But in WM again, remember all those cells we looked at under the microscope in the one of that picture there? Those cells are all identical to each other. And identical cells, by definition, must make an identical type of antibody protein, and so we call that monoclonal. And why is this important? Well, many of you in the room were diagnosed because you were minding your own business, and somebody drew a blood chemistry on you and noticed that your total protein level was elevated on your blood chemistry test. This is a very common way that WM is discovered. And what the doctor did is they ran a test called electrophoresis, or serum protein electrophoresis, and they found what's called a monoclonal spike, or M-spike. This is where the term comes from, from M-spike, it refers to monoclonal. And what this looks like, uh, this is a normal electrophoresis. So when you have your blood drawn and they run your SPEP, usually, and we're gonna go over this at the, ABC, at the understanding your labs part in the afternoon, usually people just look at the number and it says your M-spike is 0 0.4 or 4.4, you get some number, but where does that come from? Well, where it comes from is this kind of uh, 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 test here called electrophoresis. And, and on electrophoresis, it's normal to have this albumin here, and this is a normal level of antibodies in different parts of the electrophoresis test. And out here, this is the Greek letter gamma, and gamma is where IgM hides. So when you have polyclonal IgM, it looks like a broad, broad hump like that, that's normal. When you have a monoclonal spike, this is what it looks like. In a monoclonal spike, you have this very sharp peak out here, and this is called an M spike. And they'll actually measure that, and that becomes the test that gets a number like, this would be a pretty good number right here. This would be like five or something. You get a pretty good number uh, on the M spikes. This is where this comes from. Uh, the next thing that, that we have to talk about is something called quantitative immunoglobulins. This is another test for IgM. So one test for IgM is te called the M spike, but the other test is we can individually measure all those different types of antibodies. Remember the picture with the five different types of antibodies, IgG, IgM, all those and so forth? You can actually measure those individually through a test called quantitative immunoglobulins or QUIGs. And in, in the case of Waldenstrom's, usually the, w, the, usually the IgM, of course, is high. And usually it's high at the expense of the other types of antibodies, meaning that if the IgM is high, the IgG and IgA are low. And the way I explain this to patients is uh, I've adopted the, the litter of puppies uh, analogy, which is you have a litter of puppies, and one of the puppies, the IgM puppy, decides it's going to eat all the food, and he gets fat, and the other puppies get starved a little bit, and they get thin. And the exact, exact same thing happens with the antibodies in our body. So the IgM gets high, and the IgA and the, Ig, and the IgG get low. So what? Well, IgA and IgG are very important uh, um, protectors against infection in our body. And if you guys look at your labs very carefully and you see, you look at your IgM level, then go look at your IgG and IgA levels and they're probably low. And sometimes they're really low. And if they get really low, then your, your chance of getting infections might go up. So it's important to be aware of that. The next thing I want to stress is that WM occurs in phases. So you, don't, you just don't start with a marrow full of 80% LPL cells, an IgM of 4,000, and lots, lots of symptoms. You had to work to get there, and you go through phases, and it starts off as something called MGUS. And MGUS stands for, uh, or if you're from the Mayo Clinic, you say MUGUS, uh, but I call it MGUS. Uh, it stands for monoclonal gammopathy. Remember monoclonal M spike? Of undetermined significance. And what that means is you have a, uh, a protein that's elevated in the blood, uh, but you're not sure if it's causing any trouble, and I'll show you a slide in that shortly. And so all these start as MGUS, then they go through a smoldering phase, and then in some patients they become symptomatic. So some of you in the room probably technically meet the di diagnosis of MGUS. Some of you are certainly smoldering, and some of you are symptomatic, but it all goes through those phases. So this is, this is germane because patients often come in and they're diagnosed and they say, Doc, um, how long have I had this? How long have I had this? And the answer is, usually what I'll say is for, for probably years you've been working on this. And sometimes actually you can go back if you want to do some sleuthing, and you can grab some old chemistry tests that have been drawn over the years, and if you see the protein kind of creeping up in the chemistry test, then that'll give you a clue 
uh, to how long it's been there. The next few slides I borrowed from Dr. Kyle. Um, and he showed this at the educational forum maybe eight or ten years ago. And this is the definition of, of uh, what's called IgM MGUS, or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And the definition is the following, and don't worry, about, don't worry about the numbers too much, but your M spike should be low. The number of LPL cells in your marrow should be low, below 10%, and you cannot be sick from it at all. You can't have any symptoms or signs of being ill from the problem. Uh, that is no fevers, chills, sweats, anemia, enlarged lymph nodes that make you uncomfortable, et cetera, nothing. And so it's just stumbled on. And if you have this MGUS, by definition, if you look at the very bottom of the slide here, your chance of progressing to WM that needs treatment is 2%, uh, you know, 2% a year for the first 10 years and about 1% per year thereafter. All, stated alternatively, alternatively, if you have IgM MGUS without neuropathy, your chance of needing treatment for WM in your lifetime is low. It's very low. You need to be followed, but it's low. I've thrown in a few different slides this year called OncoSpeak. And OncoSpeak, uh, doctors are guilty of OncoSpeak all the time. They, they show slides to patients that, they, that we show to our colleagues without explanation. We're, we're quite guilty of that. So I'm trying to rectify that problem a little bit. And so I'm going to show you the first OncoSpeak slide I've thrown in is something called a Kaplan-Meier curve. Have any of you guys ever seen a Kaplan-Meier curve? It, 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 doctors love them. And so what is a Kaplan-Meier curve? Well, a Kaplan-Meier curve is a, it's, it's an estimate of a probability. It's, it's not an absolute, absolute number. It's a statistical uh, uh, estimate. And how does it work? Well, this is a, a sample survival curve. It's just is not, it's not any disease. It's just made up, okay? It doesn't relate to WM or you or anybody else. And so if you look here, the horizontal axis down here is time and years. And the vertical axis is a probability of surviving or a proportion of the people surviving. And so what you just do here is you start off in the far left upper corner. And at time zero, let's just say you're, you're following a, a disease called... Um, We'll just, we'll just give it a name. We'll call it uh, Bright's disease, which is not anything like this. Uh, and then you look here at a time zero, everybody's alive. And then over time, you st people start to uh, have to, to die. And over you know, 10 years, 12 years, 20 years, after 20 years, only about 20% uh, of people are alive. So how, uh, that's, that's the estimation. So in a, in a, in a Kaplan-Meier curve, what they do is they try to estimate things at various time points. So here in this one, the prob probability of survival of two years, if you look at that, is 83%. Does everyone see that at two years? And the probability of surviving at, at uh, 10 years is about 50 or 55%. So these are Kaplan-Meier curves, and these are commonly shown when, when research studies are being shown to patients. But I'm going to put a Kaplan-Meier curve in here on survival. Uh, of patients with, 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 uh, with Waldenstrom's a little bit later, uh, later and you'll have an understanding for what that really represents. So Dr. Kyle recently updated uh, uh, is with a ca nice Kaplan-Meier curve here uh, how MGUS behaves, and specifically IgM MGUS. And he published this la last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. And, and what he again showed is basically what I put in that slide before, which is the risk of progression is about 2% per year for the first 10 years. It actually looks less than that. So this is a slide here where if you look over here, this is the um, everybody is diagnosed with MGUS, IgM MGUS, or non -I, there's two types of MGUS here. The IgM MGUS is the red line. The non-IgM MGUS is the line below it. And then they're followed for many, many, many years, up to 20 years here. And if you develop, if you go from MGUS and develop Waldenstrom's or myeloma or something else, then that's called progression. And this curve actually goes up if that happens. So here, here's the non-IgM MGUS. Over 20 years, you have a very you know, low rate of developing any, a blood cancer for, for, versus IgM MGUS, where after 20 years, it's about you know, 20% or something like that. So this is a curve uh, that just tells you what your risk of progression is if you have MGUS. And Dr. Kyle told us that if you have IgM MGUS and your M spike is more than 1.5, or you have a test called a free light chain test that's abnormal, that your risk of progressing to a disease that needs to be treated is a little bit higher. A lot of you in the room have smoldering WM. 
And the term, the term we use to refer to you is your smolderers. And so I have a lot of smolderers in my practice. And so how do we diagnose smoldering WM? It's almost the same as MGUS, except for your M protein spike might be a little bit higher. And you have more than 10% lymphoma cells in your bone marrow. But again, nothing is wrong with you. You have no symptoms, no signs, no anemia, no fevers, chills, or sweats. You're a smolderer. So how is smoldering different from MGUS? Well, there's more of it. And so the risk of progression to Waldenstrom's needing treatment is higher. And the risk is about 70% by 10 years, but it appears to level off after the first five years. So I've had people smolder for 10 or 15 years, and I've had smolderers who in three or four years required treatment. So smolderers have a higher chance of turning into Waldenstrom's than MGUS. How does smoldering WM or MGUS turn into symptomatic Waldenstrom's? But it probably occurs through a complex of very significant genetic steps. And there are many researchers who are very interested in studying how precursor states become uh, states that need, need treatment. And I'm just citing one of those individuals who's Irene Gobriel in Boston. And Irene has a, um, a, an, an, a, an effort called PCROWD where she is interested in getting samples, and that's Irene in the picture here, um, getting samples from people and it's very simple to do, uh, to, to study them and just to try to understand the biology as to why a precursor state, why one, in one person it progresses to Waldenstrom's and in another person it doesn't do that. So I just put this information, it's in your handouts, you have them all here, there's contact information here if you're interested in participating in that, they'd love to hear from you. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit. How do WM patients present to their doctors? There are essentially two ways how this happens. One way is the, you're, you, you go to the doctor saying something's not right. I have a symptom, I have a sign, I don't feel well, something's wrong, doctor, and then you're diagnosed with Waldenstrom's. Or you can have what I call an incidentaloma, which is you're minding your own business, somebody draws your blood, and they notice your protein's high, something's off, they do that electrophoresis test, they find that M spike, and next thing you know, you're having a, a, a bone marrow biopsy and you're diagnosed with Waldenstrom's. So what are those symptoms that make us uh, go to the doctor? Well, this isn't all of them. This is a lot of them here, but by, over, by an overwhelming amount, the major reason people with Waldenstrom's go to their doctor is weakness and fatigue. They say, doc, something is wrong. My energy level is not good. I used to be able to do this. I used to be able to exercise and, or, or walk 18 holes of golf. I can't do that anymore. Something's wrong. Weakness and fatigue uh, are the um, major reasons that people end up going to the doctor. Um, and this is often accompanied by something called anemia, which is a low red blood cell count that accounts for a lot of this problem. Patients with Waldenstrom's may go to the doctor with bleeding manifestations. There's a, a subset of patients with Waldenstrom's have a predisposition to bleed excessively uh, for reasons that we can talk about in a little bit. Or if it's a very dramatic presentation, you may go to the doctor with hyperviscosity symptoms. And hyperviscosity symptoms are, occur when you get too much of that IgM in your blood. Remember we talked about that big protein with five antibodies all stuck together? If you get enough of that in your blood, and your blood is like 40 weight motor oil, then you might get headaches or shortness of breath or blurry vision, uh, nosebleeds, uh, that kind of thing. So you might go to the doctor with that. Some patients get weight loss because those LPL cells in your bone marrow can make a substance that makes your appetite go down or just makes you just lose weight even though you didn't intend to lose weight. You might have neurologic symptoms, such as numbness or tingling or headaches, uh, other kinds. You, you, know, you can have visual disturbances, usually from the hyperviscosity. There's something called Raynaud's phenomenon. Uh, and there are other things where you go out in cold weather, and, you're, uh, and we had a really cold winter in Colorado this year, so we had a little bit of this. Uh, and you go out and your fingers might turn purple, uh, and your circulation doesn't get very good in the cold weather. Or you might have something called amyloidosis, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Very rarely, um, patients with Waldenstrom's have the Waldenstrom's actually invade their central nervous system, actually have the lymphoma cells invade the central nervous system, the spine and or the brain. And that ha that's called Bing-Neal syndrome, or BNS. And that'll be talked about more later in the forum. Fortunately, this is a very rare complication of WM. Unfortunately, it can occur at any point of your WM. You can have it, diagno you can have it diagnosed as your initial presentation, or have it diagnosed after you've had WM for many, many years. The symptoms are quite variable. And the other thing that about 
bing Neal syndrome, which is a little bit scary from my perspective, is that you sometimes can have bing Neal be a problem when seemingly your WM is getting better and improving uh, in other parts of your body. Your IgM can be going down, but you can, you can be having a bing Neal problem, uh, central nervous system lymphoma in your brain. If we're suspicious of bing Neal syndrome, and, and, and we don't have to look very often for this, but if we are, but you, do, you have to do an MRI, and not just an MRI, you have to do, to do an MRI with something called contrast and often a spinal fluid examination. And this is an example of an MRI. And, and basically, I know all of us here have a lot of experience looking at MRIs, um, but we'll just go over this. So MRIs, when you put the contrast in, things that are really irritated or abnormal, they get bright with the contrast on this particular type of MRI here. So you look here on the side of the brain, you see that up there? and you can see it right here on a different view, and here's the aerial view here. This bright part here would be very suspicious for Bing Neal in a Waldenstrom's patient. And if you saw that, then the next thing that you would do is you'd take a sample of spinal fluid and do special testing on the spinal fluid to look for Waldenstrom cells. This might be one of the most important slides I have in this introduction uh, ABC talk, which is that WM is different in everybody. WM is different in everybody. And so your course is going to be unique to you. And you're, you're going to read about, you know, you're going to read about, you know, you're hear about at the conference here, if you're on the torch, if you're on the IWMF website, you're going to read about a lot of other people's experience with WM. And you have to realize that that's their unique experience. And your experience is likely to be very different from other people's experience. And so keep that in mind, not just how you present, how your symptoms are, but how you respond to treatment, how you tolerate the treatment, which treatments might be right for you. So your course is, if you read about someone who took a drug and their ear fell off, it doesn't mean it'll happen to you. you know? and, and, if, and conversely, if someone took a drug and it worked, it doesn't mean it'll work for you. So it's very individualized, you have to keep that in mind. These are those cells we saw earlier today. So you recognize these guys? Here, here's all these WM cells. And so how can WM misbehave and cause those symptoms we talk about? Well, it can do it either through the lymphoma cells, those LPL cells doing things, and that's over here where it, causes, it can make, those LPL cells can swell your lymph nodes or swell your spleen. It can cause fatigue or sweats. Or the IgM can cause trouble. The IgM can cause hyperviscosity syndrome, bleeding, headaches, neuropathy, and these weird complications that can affect your kidney or make your ear, nose, or fingers turn blue in cold weather. So uh, some people, when, they, when, when I see them and they have a symptom, I'll go, aha, uh -huh, that's, that's from your lymphoma cells, or aha, uh -huh, that's from your IgM. Some of you in the crowd have IgM neuropathy, like I said before. And usually you, the people with IgM neuropathy usually, but not always, have very low levels of IgM and very low levels of, of the LPL cells in their bone marrow. And IgM neuropathy, I, I would say, without any doubt, is for me the most challenging clinical situation I see in the IgM world. Because there are different types of IgM neuropathy, and I listed some of the names of them here. There's one called anti-mag, there's one called DADS or DADS, there's a GM1 neuropathy, there's something called amyloid that can cause neuropathy. The symptoms overlap. It can be extraordinarily difficult to distinguish one type of neuropathy from the other. The neuropathies can occur and worsen over many, many, many years, and they can fool you because the patient can be getting worse, and you, you may not recognize it because the changes are slow to occur. Uh, the clinical course is variable. L left unchecked or unimproved, patients can become debilitated from the IgM neuropathy and have trouble with their gait. And the treatment that we use is, is, is variably effective. So at the, WM at the WM workshop last October in New York, there were several hours devoted at the conference to IgM neuropathy, research presented from around the world, all kinds of talks, and I walked out of there and I said, I, I don't know that I'm any smarter. I, I'm still, I, I still am not exactly sure what to do all the time when I face a patient who has IgM neuropathy. Do I give this treatment or that treatment? When do I intervene? When do I use this chemo or not? So it's a really challenging problem. Okay, so let's, let's change again gears and say, okay, so when we have a patient who has WM, what tests are required when someone has WM? Uh, well, we've already talked about the bone marrow biopsy has to be done and the blood work defines the IgM, but there's a lot of other blood work we need to do. 
We need to do chemistry tests to make sure that the kidneys are healthy. Sometimes the kidneys can be affected by WM. And we need to do a urine test. And if this hasn't been done, you need to ask your doctor about it if you have WM, because some people with WM have a condition called amyloidosis. And amyloidosis, as I indicated at the bottom of the slide, is, is, a, is a topic that's really beyond this, the, the, the scope of what I'm presenting today. But the TORCH, which is a publication of the IWMF, and if you haven't looked at the TORCH, you need to look at the TORCH. There are two of the world's absolute experts in amyloidosis. Uh, one's Merlini from Italy and Maury Gertz from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, who have written review articles about amyloid in the TORCH. And I'm going to encourage, encourage you to read that because somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of individuals with WM also have this condition called amyloidosis. And it can be uh, also a very challenging problem to diagnose. So and one way to find it, if it's in the kidney, is through this, this urine test. Uh, and these days, we, 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 when we do a bone marrow test, if you're newly diagnosed, you should have this test called MYD or MID-88 performed. Uh, if you were diagnosed 15 years ago and you're smoldering and you're doing okay, you don't need to have a repeat bone marrow test to look for the MID-88 mutation. But if you're newly diagnosed, for the most part, most pathology doctors and programs are running this, this test on our patients with WM. I'm going to talk more about this in a bit. Sometimes CAT scans or CAT scan PET scans are done. They're not very helpful in WM. A lot of you probably had them done, but WM is a disease that mostly occurs inside the bone marrow. Sometimes it swells the lymph nodes or the spleen, but not very often. And so I don't find CAT scans or PET scans very helpful unless I smell a problem that needs to have that test, in my opinion. The most important thing by far, far, far and away when a doctor is evaluating and testing a patient with Waldenstrom's is to talk to, and this is hard for some doctors, listen to the patient, listen to the patient, because what comes out of the patient's mouth is going to tell you virtually all the time whether or not they need to be treated. So patients often come into the clinic, and I saw this guy again I saw yesterday, he came in, he's an engineer, he had, he had Excel spreadsheets of his IgMs and his, and his hematocrit and his hemoglobin and, and, and everything. And I took it and I said, this is great that you have it. I set it aside and I said, tell me how you feel. Tell me how you feel. And, and he said, I'm, I'm tired, I can't do things, I have sweats at nighttime. And I didn't need to see his labs to know that this guy needs treatment, right? And conversely, if someone comes in and says, I feel like a million bucks, it's pretty rare that I'm going to look at the laboratory work and say, oh, but you need treatment even though you feel great. That doesn't happen very often. And so talking to the patient is the most important thing by far and away. I just listed here a few tests that we sometimes add on in the WM world. Some of you may have had these. Uh, cryoglobulins, cold agglutinins. We mentioned amyloid before. And one thing is that some of you in the room probably have something called von Willebrand's disease. Which is, a, which is a type of acquired hemophilia. Acquired hemophilia predispo predisposes you to having excessive bleeding with procedures. And so it's important, uh, whenever I see a WM patient, I always do a screening test for this just to make sure they don't have it. If you have neuropathy, the bottom two tests should be performed if they haven't been performed. And a great resource for all of you uh, is, again, through the IWMF, there's a, there's a booklet here available in uh, print or electronic form uh, called Understanding Your Blood Tests that is great reading and reviewed by people who do this for a living, and, and it's a great resource for understanding your, your blood test. I'm going to touch on viscosity again a little bit here. We talked about this before. Viscosity basically measures the resistance of fluid to flow, and water is, uh, flows readily, is less viscous. I call that thin. And if an oil, like we referred to before, is more viscous and thick. And if you have too much of the IgM in your blood, it can make your blood thick and cause things such as headaches, uh, nosebleeds, vision changes, other things like that. And if people have this thing called hyperviscosity syndrome, you may undergo a procedure called plasmapheresis. Has anyone in the room undergone plasmapheresis? A uh, fair number of you. Plasmapheresis is using a machine. Uh, it's an outpatient procedure normally, and you sit in a lazy boy recliner, and you get two IVs put in you and sit next to this machine that's on the slide, and the machine, over a few hours, can remove a lot of the IgM that's in your blood. It removes it temporarily. It does not address the underlying production of the IgM, so plasmapheresis is usually a way to transition someone to more effective treatment and make them feel better in the interim. And so plasmapheresis is a pretty standard thing to do. It might be done by your hematologist. It might be done in a blood center. It might be done by a kidney specialist.
We talked about to diagnose this disease, you have to have a bone marrow biopsy and have this thing called IgM in the blood. And then we talked about that thing called the mid-88 mutation. This is a typical bone marrow biopsy report that you'll see. Some of you are probably pretty good at keeping all your labs in a binder or keeping them around and keeping your bone marrow biopsy report. I would encourage you to do that. And if you do that, your bone marrow biopsy pr report probably looks something like this, which is a mix of these cells called lymphocytes, plasma cells and lymphoplasmacytoid, LPL cells in the bone marrow. Sometimes you see mast cells in there. And this is a very typical bone marrow biopsy report that you see. Okay, so prognosis. Everyone wants to know their prognosis. And we want to know patients' prognosis as well. The most common tool out there for prognosis is, is called the International Scale, an ISSWM here, which was published in 2009. So it was published in 2009. That means the data that went into that evaluation was accumulated way, way, way back, and I would say the dark ages of WM treatment possibly. And so when anyone, when you ask your prognosis in WM or you're looking into it, I would say pay very little attention to what you read. Pay very little attention to what you read. And remember that in WM, survival is long. Survival is long. And our goal of treatment in WM or managing patients with WM is long survival with good quality of life. That's our, always our goal in WM, long survival with good quality of life. It's kind of hard to get your hands, get our hands around what survival looks like, but this is an analysis done by Jorge Castillo, who's going to uh, land at the airport this afternoon and come talk to you guys a lot today. And what this looks at is, again, a Kaplan-Meier curve. We're looking at that where at time zero, everybody's around, and then over the years here, uh, people begin to die. And this separates people based on the age they were when they were diagnosed with WM. So the lowest uh, curve there are people who are diagnosed over the age of 80. And the upper curve is people who are diagnosed be before the age of 50. Then you have people in between. So what you see here, again, this is, reflects a lot of our older treatments. Keep that in mind, right? Uh, and not, the, not our more modern treatments. These are, this, these are estimates of survival probabilities depending on how old you were when you were diagnosed. And so I always say to patients, expect to be here a long time. Treatment. Again, there'll be a lot more on specifics of treatment later, but I want to tell, talk to you guys about how when someone needs treatment, what goes in, what's in my head and what, what discussion do I have with my patients when treatment's being considered? First and foremost, with your patient, determine the goals of treatment. Determine the goals of treatment. It's different for every patient. And so when I'm doing that with my patient, I say, first of all, I go, are you young and vigorous or old and frail? Young and vigorous or old and frail? And, and, and young and old are not chronological, they're physiological. Does that make sense? So we have in Colorado where I work, we have 75-year-olds who climb 14ers or ski 100 days a year, walk 18 holes of golf 90 times a year. These are all real examples of WM patients. Is, those, is that patient old? Like, no way, right? And conversely, you can have a 60-year-old who has diabetes, heart failure, is frail, is in a wheelchair or something. Like, that, that's an older person. So the, 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 the uh, distinction there is more physiologic than chronologic. And then, remember we talked before about our garden? And do we have to get rid of all the weeds or just some of the weeds? So the next thing I say, am I interested in making my patient feel better, which is improving symptoms or fixing anemia? Or do I believe that the deepest rest remission possible is important? So what's the goal of treatment? Is it, is it just control it a little bit to make my patient feel better? Or, heck, if we're going to treat this, let's try to get rid of it all the way. And patients and physicians need to come to this understanding together. Next thing is my, and this is, this is a really big thing right now, is, is the patient interested in fixed duration therapy or continuous therapy? So we have treatments that are done in a matter of months for the most part, and you can be done four or six months, and may, maybe a little thing called rituxan for a little while afterwards. And we have treatments that I'm gonna put you on this treatment, and oh, by the way, how long do we need to take it, doctor? Forever, well, for a long time, until it quits working or you, or you uh, don't, don't like the side effects. Years, right? So we have those two treatments, and patients will tell you that one appeals more than the other. The other thing is that we have these genes I'm gonna talk about called MID88 and CXCR4, 
And sometimes these come into the discussion for which treatments we select for patients. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is do we have a patient who needs rapid control of symptoms? Some of our treatments work very slowly to control symptoms. So if I have a patient who's really symptomatic, fevers, chills, drenching sweats, I feel horrible, doctor. You don't want a treatment that takes months to work. You want a treatment that's going to make my patient feel better relatively quickly. And the other thing to keep in mind is that some of our treatments can cause peripheral neuropathy. So if you have peripheral neuropathy, we want to avoid treatments that can cause per peripheral neuropathy. These are just guidelines, and then we can get down to specifics with our treatment with patients. And again, you'll hear from experts later in the, about that. When do we treat people? Again, we don't treat asymptomatic people. We do not treat asymptomatic people. We don't treat the IgM level. Most common reason I see a second opinion is my IgM was high. My doctor said I needed treatment. I put the labs on the table. I say, tell me how you feel. I feel great, doctor. You don't need treatment. So the IgM level by itself is not a reason to treat. If you have anemia, that's a, that's a low hematocrit here or very low platelet count. That can be a reason to treat. Obviously, if you're symptomatic, we should treat you. If you have hyperviscosity, that's a reason to treat. Moderate to severe neuropathy is a reason. Then if you have these rare conditions here called cryoglobulinemia or cold gluten disease, that's also a reason to treat. One thing that's really important to remember is that the level of IgM and or the percentage of the lymphoma cells in your marrow varies tremendously between each and every one of you. You can have a patient with a very low IgM level in their blood who's tremendously symptomatic, tremendously symptomatic, and conversely, you can have somebody with an IgM of 6,000 who feels like a million bucks. So keep that in mind. IgM and is different in everybody. And this is a slide that Dr. Treon published years ago. And if you look at it, you say, this is, there's, what's, what's he doing showing me this slide today? But don't worry, I'm going to walk you through it. And what this slide looks at um, is this is the uh, percentage of bone barrel involvement here in the first slide a little or a lot, and this is the IgM level. So you know, somebody who has a, very, a marrow that's virtually completely replaced by lymphoma with a low IgM level or a high IgM level. And you can have somebody with very little lymphoma in the marrow with a low IgM level or a high IgM level. So it's gonna be the same, in, in, within an individual patient, it's always gonna be the same, right? You, you have your LPL, it makes this much IgM. But between patients, it's tremendously variable. And the same holds true if you're looking at IgM levels in hematocrit, which is anemia, and so forth. Let's talk about mutations. So genetic mutations are something that we all need to be aware of, I think, these days in WM. And it's only going to become more and more an important part of, of taking care of this disease. And what we're talking about here are genetic changes in the DNA. The DNA is the blueprint inside all of our blood cells. And these genetic changes that we're talking about are changes that occurred after you were born, after you were conceived, okay? They're not changes that you were born with. They're not changes that you pass on. They, they were acquired by chance over our lifetime. And those are called somatic mutations. How do these occur? Well, we're, we're reproducing cells all the time, right, in our body, just forever and ever and ever as long as we live. And, and our body has a tremendous spell checker. Uh, I don't know if you guys use spell checker all the time when you're doing documents, but I, I would be dead without it. But our body has a great spell checker that works almost every single time. Almost every single time. And sometimes it doesn't work, and mutations can occur in the, in the DNA, and those mutations, if they're a certain kind, can result in, for example, cancer. So these are somatic mutations. And in WM, there are two big ones. One's called MID88, and one's called CXCR4. And there are people that did all the groundwork that are going to talk to you during this conference about this today. And we're learning that these mutations can influence not only how the WM might behave clinically, but how it can respond to certain treatments. So these mutations are not just there and they're descriptive. They can really in inform us as to how the WM may affect our patient and how certain treatments may work depending on these mutations. Now, the most important mutation is called MID88. It's present in virtually every patient. And depending on the type of testing that's done, you may find it in 90% or 99% of, of individuals with WM. And it's always one specific mutation, and testing's pretty ubiquitous these days. The other mutation called CXCR4 is a little more challenging. Uh, there are at least 40 uh, different CXCR4 mutations. This mutation is found in only 40% of individuals with, with WM. And the, the, the technical part of the testing is more challenging. And so I don't have a tremendous faith in commercial testing for this mutation yet. 
If this testing is done at the Dana-Farber, I have incredible faith in the testing. And so some doctors test for this all the time, others don't. This is the a paper that just shows you that this mutation, this was published, I believe, in 2012. And this genetic mutation has really, really changed the whole landscape of our disease. And I just put it up here because it's such a historical landmark for us. These are the CXCR4 mutations. And actually, to get lunch today, I believe you have to identify at least half of these CXCR4 <laughs> four mutations before Carl will let you eat. OK, so uh, more OncoSpeak. So for OncoSpeak, these are things you're going to hear from doctors all the time at the, uh, at the forum here today. And one is called response rate. Response rate is basically the percent of patients who have at least a 50% reduction in the measurable IgM. That's a partial response, so you'll hear that. And then PFS, doctors are always talking about PFS, PFS, PFS. What is PFS? It's called progression-free survival. It's how long patients went before relapsing or dying of disease. And it's always shown on Kaplan-Meier curves, or usually shown on Kaplan-Meier curves. And then doctors talk about overall survival, which is exactly what it says. And then here's all the genetic stuff that's out there. So there's something called wild type, uh, which is unmutated, meaning the gene is exactly what it was like uh, it, it, uh, before, it hasn't been altered at all. And we use the wild type terminology to refer to mid-88 and CXCR4. It's the opposite of mutated. So mutated, wild type. Wild type is the normal, what you were born with, versus mutated, it's somatic mutation. Another word for mutated CXCR4, we just can't have one, is called WIM. And mutated mid-88, we just can't say mutated, sometimes we call it L265P. And just in case you're interested, there are different types of mutations in CXCR4, and some are called nonsense, and some are called frame shift. You'll see this in the literature if, you're, if you dive into this. So here's uh, how do we use this testing. Well, you can use mid-88 and CXCR4 testing to distinguish, to distinguish between different diseases. Uh, for example, if you have WM, virtually everybody has the mid-88 mutation. Usually about 40% of patients have the CXCR4 mutation. If you have multiple myeloma, no one should have the mid-88 mutation or the CXCR4 mutation. Some other lymphomas, though, do have the mid-88 mutation, yep, and that's, this becomes sometimes a little bit of a puzzle for doctors. Uh, we're learning that some, the, the CXCR4 mutation can affect how the WM manifests in an individual, in a patient. And so this is wild type on the left and mutated on the right. We see here for some, some mutated CXCR4, CXCR4 mutated patients, more of those, for example, might have this thing called um, acquired von Willebrand's disease, remember that bleeding condition I referred to. There are different genetic types of WM now, so it's not just WM, it's, well, your mid-88 CXCR4 mutated WM, your mid-88 wild type CXCR4 wild type WM. So we're starting to break WM patients down in different categories. We're not always sure what to do with the information, but we're learning what to do with this information. So this testing is going to become more and more germane in our management of WM patients. And for example here, on the far left, this, the majority of WM patients are what's called mutated and wild type. That is mutated for the mid-88 and unmutated for the CXCR4. A minority of patients are wild type for both, fewer than 10%. And what you see here is that the IgM levels tend to be lower in these patients than in other kinds, less, less disease in the bone marrow. And these drugs called BTK inhibitors like abrutinib just don't work well here. So again, we're starting to break people down in different categories. And again, what I said in, in this slide, I said there's, this is called genotypic and phenotypic association. And just so this, I put this in just in case you look at these slides later. Genotypic is what the DNA is, and phenotypic is how it looks in the patient, meaning that there's a genetic change, and the genetic change may look differently in individual patients. That's genotype and phenotype. I'm going to, in the interest of time, to leave time for questions. Um, these, these are, there's slides in your, in your here. I'm going to go through a couple of these slides and just go through them and, and, uh, and talk about something called transformation. So I went ahead to slide 55. So transformation is a fortunately rare event that occurs when those LPL cells, those hopefully slow-growing lymphoma cells in the, in the bone marrow, they mutate further and they morph into a very aggressive kind of lymphoma known as, as large B-cell lymphoma. That's a very serious event when that happens. So look, transformation is a, it can be a life-threatening event. It has to be treated, treated very seriously if it happens.
And one thing we've learned is that if tra transformation is more likely if you do not have the mid-88 mutation, that is, if you don't have the L265P mutation, your chance of having transformation is higher than if you do, and that's what this Kaplan-Meier curve shows here. Last thing is, sometimes we see people who don't have the mid-88 mutation, and when we do that, we have to ask, that we being the doctors, we have to ask ourselves, is this really Waldenstrom's? Because remember, virtually everybody with, the, with, with Waldenstrom's, if you test properly, has the mid-88 mutation. Now, some people with Waldenstrom's do not have it, do not have it. But if I see a patient who's said to be wild type for mid-88, in the back of my mind I say, it, do they have a disease that's not Waldenstrom's? And the major one is something called IgM multiple myeloma. And, and a lot of times when, you're, when, when you guys were first sent to the doctor, they probably thought you had myeloma because your SPEP was abnormal and you didn't. So IgM myeloma is extremely rare, but it happens. And so this is just a checklist that I have in my head when somebody does not have the MYD88 mutation. I want to acknowledge a couple of giants in the field. The first is Dr. Waldenstrom. And so this is Dr. Waldenstrom, and everyone shows this slide at every Waldenstrom talk because this guy truly was a giant. But there's someone else that I want to acknowledge as well in WM, and, and I've cited his work many times today. You'll hear his work cited many times throughout the media, and I want to give proper acknowledgement uh, to this individual. And everyone knows that in the city of brotherly love, uh, every, you know, Rocky's a big deal here, right? Has anyone been to the Rocky Steps yet? I, had, I got in late last night. Who's been to the Rocky Steps? Nobody yet? Okay. okay. Anyway, and so, and that doctor, of course, is Dr. Treon. Dr. Steve Treon is at the Bing Center in Dana-Farber. And, 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 and really, Dr. Treon does what he does because Chris Patterson keeps him square. And so I asked Chris, I asked Chris for a picture of Dr. Treon to show at the educational forum. And, uh, <laughs> and so... Uh, This is it, and uh, Steve has no idea, and he's not here yet, thank goodness, uh, that this, this slide is being shown, but um, with apologies and thanks to Chris. Okay, thank you. So we can take questions, right, Carl? Do we have time for questions? And remember, if you have a question, um, Everyone else has the same question. The question is, there a connection between a disease called polycythemia vera and Waldenstrom? So polycythemia vera is a totally different blood cancer, and there's no connection. So P. vera is a blood cancer where the bone marrow way overproduces every kind of cell in the bone marrow, the red cells, the white cells, the platelets, but there's no connection between P. vera and Waldenstrom's. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, earlier you mentioned treating a patient just a little bit. Uh-huh. What, what does that look like? So one example is, let's, let's say you have somebody who's minimally symptomatic, uh, and, and maybe they're frail, and then you, you can use a treatment like rituximab, single-agent rituximab, which is an antibody well-tolerated. You're not going to make anybody sick. They get an IV treatment every few months, maybe. Uh, and so that's an example of treating somebody just to make them feel better. They have a little bit of anemia maybe, that kind of thing, not terribly symptomatic. Or they have a little peripheral neuropathy and you don't want to treat them very aggressively. So a treatment, um, it all depends on, also depends on what the patient's goals are, how, how much they're willing to tolerate in terms of side effects, right, from treatment. And so, and it may look, may look like a brutinib, like a pill like a brutinib. It can be sometimes just a... Uh, what I call a, a, a partial weeding pill. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I, you bet. Ibrutinib, rituximab, that sounds like treatment. I didn't it know is, what a is, little it fix So I, I would say it, it, it depends, but it, it, ibrutinib I would, I would put in the category of really good treatment, but it rarely, rarely produces complete remissions or really profound remissions. So you get some of the weeds out, but not a lot of the weeds out. That's, I would put ibrutinib in that category for the majority of patients. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the question is, what are the different genetic types of WM? Okay. So basically, there are, you can look at two genes, mid-88 and CXCR4, and they can be either mutated or unmutated, right? So that gives you four categories, essentially, right there. But, but here it's a little different than that. So, so when you look at the mid-88 mutation, and if L265P means it's mutated, w, w, that's the first three categories. The top one is not mutated. 
Then you can have CXCR4 unmutated, which is the first and fourth categories. And in the middle, there's CXCR4 mutations, but different kinds of CXCR4 mutations. What this means is, it looks as though, depending on these mutations, the way the, the WM manifests in a patient can change, depending on how high their IgM is, how much lymphoma is in the bone marrow, and whether or not a drug like a brutinib works really well or not in those patients. And so if you look in the first category, which is the largest category, um, then you, what you find there is drugs like a brutinib tend to work really, really well for patients with MYD88 mutations and without CXCR4 mutations. And if you look in the third category, you see that that type of WM tends to have really high IgM levels, lots of disease in the marrow, and drugs like a brutinib work so-so in that setting. So we're starting to use this information to make cl clinical decisions. If you believe, if you have confidence in your CXCR4 testing, right? I understand that peripheral neuropathy is caused by the blood vessels that are serving the nerves are, become congested, just like we see in the, in the eyes, uh, vessels in the eyes. Does this mean that physical exercise or functional electrical stimulation would be possible remedies for peripheral neuropathy? So that's only a, a very minor way in which neuropathy occurs. Very often the neuropathy occurs because the IgM protein attacks the outside cover of the nerve oh. that, that helps the nerve conduct and do its thing. And so, but, but your question was a great question, which is what's the role of exercise for that or any other problem? And, and I'll tell you this, and this is the truth, that if you look at any, virtually any medical problem, and look at exercise versus being sedentary, the people who exercise, their symptoms are better. And so absolutely exercise can help with most symptoms, including neuropathy from WM, <coughs> without any doubt. What about FES, uh, functional I, electric I don't know stimulation? Much about, I don't know much about that, to be okay. honest with you. When, when, when you get into treating neuropathy, it's such a frustrating problem that a lot of what we do I call modern day alchemy, which is we just try everything. You know, I, I'll, tell, I'll tell patients, you can try, you want, you want to try acupuncture, go ahead, you want to try, in Colorado, of course, you know what they want to try. But the, uh, uh, you know, you can try any of these things and see if it helps you. But yeah, and so I don't, I don't, know, don't know much about FES though. Okay, sorry. Is there any, um hobbies or occupations that predispose a person to develop this? For an example, a um, person that works in stained glass is more at risk for lead poisoning. Um, I, I have not heard of any occupational exposures for WM. And if anybody else knows the answer to that, I don't know if Zach does or anybody else, but I, uh, Carl or, yeah, I, I have not heard about that. And then I have- Agent Orange, but that, that occupation, hopefully we don't have anymore. Yeah. I have another question as well. I yeah. know that um, umbilical cord blood can be banked now uh -huh. for, um, for stem cell transplants. Is uh -huh. this something, is this a viable treatment for? No, I would not recommend that at all in a WM patient. We rarely do any kind of transplants in WM patients. We, we do, but when we do them, they're almost always using the patient's own stem cells. That's called an autologous transplant. It's occasionally done in WM. And, and hardly ever is a donor transplant, hardly ever. And so I do not recommend banking the stem cells. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, thank you very much. You um, for those of us who were, had bone marrow biopsies and diagnosed and treated before the genetic testing uh -huh. came, should we get a bone marrow, bi repeat bone marrow biopsy before we treat again? I would, yes. Yeah. So, so, I, I, so uh, I wouldn't get one just out of curiosity. Right. But if you're getting symptomatic again, your doctor's in, uh, thinking about treatment, then I am recommending to my patients in that setting that they consider a bone marrow biopsy with genetic testing. Yes, thank you. Hi. Um, I, I'm newly diagnosed, and before I was diagnosed, I was having some problems with my legs, peripheral neuropathy uh -huh. kind of thing. But when I had the study done, it said I didn't have peripheral neuropathy. But from my mid-calf down to my feet, my legs get really cold. And so when I saw the doctor for the Waldernstrom's, uh -huh. he said that possibly could be peripheral neuropathy, yeah. even though the tests showed negative. Yeah, were they achy? Sometimes their patients complain of a deep bone ache yes. with Waldernstrom's. So I have learned this over the years that the peripheral neuropathy of WM can manifest in different ways and may not 
show up in a traditional peripheral neuropathy like nerve conduction test. And so, yeah, when patients with WM get these deep bone aches and leg aches and weird feelings, that's WM. Yeah. And even though it comes and goes, it's not always there, yeah. would it still be something you would treat early? Well, it's one of those things where whenever a patient has a symptom where you're not sure if you want to or need to treat it, the question I always ask my patient, if they say, I'm, I'm tired or I have this, I say, are you tired enough where you want me to give you chemotherapy? Right. You know, and then they'll say, I'm not that tired. Is, okay. your, is, there, is, your, is your neuropathy bad enough you want me to give you Rituxan or IVIG? Nah, it's not that bad, doc. And so the, the, the patient will tell you. Okay, but on the nerve issue, he said that if I waited too long, I could yeah. get into some really bad... Yeah, it can. And so, uh, and so this is, the, again, this is, like I said before, this is the most difficult clinical issue I think that I face in my practice and and, and I, I, I think that if someone has a neuropathy that's bothering them it's worth trying an intervention and the most common intervention we try is usually this drug called rituximab um, sometimes there's one called IVIG or gamma globulin that works for patients so it's reasonable to try those things okay thank you very much you bet. I know you don't treat uh, non-symptomatic people, but do you have an upper limit for the IgM if it like gets to eight or nine thousand? But it's Even pretty rare. I don't. Having said that, usually if somebody gets really high, usually something's going on, right? Usually they've got neuropathy or a little bit of anemia. There's some problem that that shows up. But no, I don't treat the number. I treat. I still treat the patient. Yeah, okay. it's really hard to do sometimes too to look at that 8,000 number and say, are you still smoldering? Um, we're hearing a lot in the news about um, Roundup and its uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma connection. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering what, uh, what is the latest on that? Yeah, so my source is NPR. Uh, so NPR had, they had like about, when, they were, when Monsanto or whoever, or whoever owns them now was in court again, the NPR actually had a really nice article on this, and, and I'm as confused as ever, to be honest with you. And I don't know anything with respect to WM and, and Roundup, so I, I'm really ignorant about that at all, and, and I, I just don't know. I had a question about it being, um, you say it's mutated genes normally, uh -huh. but how is it genetic? Like, I have a 29-year-old daughter who has that, been diagnosed with the uh, Sor Sorgren's, and then she also has antiphospholipid syndrome, uh -huh. but I see a lot, and she's 29, but yet if this was a mutated, how, I mean, is it possible that she's gonna mutate too? How, how is no, the no. relationship? No, so these there? are all random events. So genes are always mutating in our body. And many of these mutations that occur don't result in any health consequence whatsoever. But in, the, in, in your daughter's situation, she clearly has gene or genes that are in the autoimmune category, in the autoimmune category, mm -hmm. that have resulted in, in her issues. And in the Waldenstrom's patients, we have these genetic mutations that occur, at least a couple of them in these genes that we talked about this morning. And so, but again, these genetic mutations are, are random events. And, uh, um, and again, they don't, they don't get passed on, like we talked about, and they just, they just occur. Now, there's some connection between autoimmune diseases and non hodgkins and B-cell lymphomas. Okay. Yeah, there's some connection there for sure. You can find, yeah. Okay, so that would be the relationship, is that? Possibly. The non hodgkins okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I've been told that because my platelets are low and my hemoglobin is low, uh -huh. not to fly and not to go to Colorado, my favorite state. So I, I wanted to know how high altitude affects your platelets. Do you, do you, do you or have hemoglobin? sickle cell? Do you have sickle cell disease? I don't think so. You can go to Colorado. Thank you. Okay, so, so there, yeah. I mean, is there any problem with getting on a plane? No. 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 How how low are your platelets? Pretty low. Like About two? Thirty thousand. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, no, I, I, don't, I don't get that. Okay, yeah. no, but I was told several times. Ask the I other asked. doctors, but I, 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 don't, I don't get that. Because okay. I thought, you know, there must be people in Colorado who have no, no, this, no, so they don't go to Kansas. Of course, yeah, so the, yeah, you, you, if you're anemic, you're going to feel the altitude more, right? You're going right. to feel it more, but you, but you can go. You're not going to be able to maybe run up the, the mountain. I don't but, think so. But, but you can go, and, and just be aware that you're going to be more symptomatic. And low platelets, 
you got you to be below 10,000 to really have issues, in my opinion, with, with activity. You know, a really low number, unless you're okay. a mountain biker, you know, sky jumper, something like that. Thank you. You bet. We have a question in the front. I'm going to bring the microphone down, though. Um, how is impor important is it to have, like, my doctor's a hematologist. And I've read in the booklets that you should see a Waldenstrom specialist. Um, is that? Common question. So, so the, the question is, do I, my cancer doc's pretty good. Do I need to see someone who does this a lot? And, and Dr. Gertz um, wrote a great article in the Torch about this, about getting second opinions. And if you're doing okay, it's like, if you're asymptomatic, you're doing okay, that's fine. But a lot of times, a second opinion is a good thing. And the uh, and a lot of, most Waldenstrom's docs work really 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 well with with the frontline hematology oncology doctors and work in concert. So sometimes if it's if you're doing okay, you probably don't need to. If you have issues, it's and, and you can do it. It's probably not a bad idea to see a WM specialist if you can. And the WM specialist will, will, will be more than happy to work with your local doc and just provide input. And the local docs appreciate it because the local docs aren't seeing a ton of Waldenstrom's, right? They're seeing, they may have a few patients. Uh, so certainly if there are any issues or complications or things aren't going quite how you wanted them to go, that's when I would think of strongly about getting a second opinion. And the IWMF on their website has a list of physicians all around the world who have this as an interest, and there are even more physicians that, that, are on that, that are on that list who are very good at WM. Are our bones more fragile with Waldenstrom? I don't think so. Are the bones more fragile? I don't think so. Uh, and so some of the treatments, depending on the treatments, can make the bones more fragile. But unlike multiple myeloma, where the bones do get more fragile, WM, I don't think of that being a complication. Oh, I've had t uh, 12 fractures in 24 months but you're saying not from Waldenstrom's. It's probably not from Waldenstrom's, okay. it, you know, but I would sure make sure that you didn't have other causes of weak bones. There's other evaluations that can be done for that. Okay, thank you. Quick question, I hope. The, uh, you talked about bleeding. Would bruising, unusual bruising that didn't cause external bleeding be an issue? Cla yeah, yeah, absolutely, that can happen with Waldenstrom's through a couple different mechanisms. A low platelet count. You have this thing called acquired von Willebrand's disease, and a blood test called a PTT. PTT can help screen for that, or this complication called amyloidosis can screen can result in bruising. There are at least three different causes that can do that. Thank you. Sure. So, the, so some people remember we talked about WM being primarily a disease that's in the bone marrow, and those lymphoma cells normally park in the bone marrow, but sometimes they go in the lymph node tissue and make the lymph nodes of the spleen big. So about 15% of patients show up with enlarged lymph nodes. Is, does that have any prognostic significance or other important significance? The answer is no. I, I just look at it and say, okay, if they don't bother you and you're otherwise asymptomatic, then I'll sometimes just watch you and call you smoldering. If they bother you, then we'll treat you. And so, but it doesn't mean anything. But now what does mean something, if you have an enlarged lymph node and, and then one of them takes off and gets real big real fast, that worries me for transformation. Uh, but if they're all behaving, staying small, not changing, just does, doesn't change anything that we do with the patient. Um, One more question for Carl. Yeah, my, my question is regarding coughing. Coughing, I, I start um, to have a chronic cough and including choking up. Um, and then when I get treated, it stops. However, I never see it on the list of symptoms that is presented. You didn't uh, oh, I, no, include I didn't. it, but I always yeah. meet patients um, on these yeah. gatherings. What is it cost and why is it not included? So if you ask 100 doctors what causes coughing in WM, you'll get... 50 different opinions, maybe, because the answer is we don't know. But I'll give you my thoughts about this, but I could be completely wrong. I could be totally wrong about this. Sometimes you can have small lymph nodes that get in the, in the middle of the chest or little infiltration of the, of the cells in different parts of the lung that can result in a cough. Some people get lymph nodes or, or in sw swollen lymph tissue in the back of their throat that can result in cough. Or rarely, there's this thing called amyloidosis that can affect the tissues in the aerodigestive pathway here 
that can cause cough. But the honest answer is I don't have an idea at all. I don't see it very much, thank goodness. But I absolutely have people like you who say I cough, and when I don't have Waldenstrom's, I don't cough as much. But I don't understand why. Yeah, it, it stopped within 24 hours of me yeah. taking a put in it, but it was, uh, I couldn't yeah. go to a theater anymore. I couldn't yeah. sit in the subway. People yeah. gave me... Uh, I, I don't get it. Maybe, maybe one of the smarter doctors who comes later can answer your question better. Okay. Okay, you guys. Thanks. Enjoy the forum. Thank you.